chip. And again, although we don't have all information, we do know that that these efforts that were described at Dugway were in fact a part of the process of creating 1029. And so it's plausible that the material that, that we were told about uh, at Dugway was in fact material that was, uh, was sent to USAMRID and became part of 1029. That there, therefore, um, can we say with certainty that the attack spores can only have come from 1029, given that uh, these distinctive characteristics might have existed in a batch before it arrived? How can you, how can you pinpoint it to one flask? Well, I think we are saying that, that one cannot uh, arrive at a definitive conclusion about the origins of the spores in the letters for a variety of reasons, including the general one that underlies your question. Next question. Hey, there's no longer uh, any question. Oh, right here. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on that. I was, I had the privilege of attending a number of your open sessions. And what I recall, uh, admittedly it was a long time ago, but what I recall from the discussion was that mutations in anthrax were not particularly unusual. And that these particular mutations were not especially unusual. So the question that I would like to get to is that of all the samples that were available for testing, given the rate of mutation within anthrax as, as, uh, as we've discussed, and the fact that there had to be at least one more growth stage to get to the letters, I mean, clearly you said that this, you can't definitively link this to the flask, but how many of the other samples could have been the, the, the source, the foundation for what ultimately ended up in the letters. Do you have any, any sense of that? Uh, how, what percentage might have led to You know, and there are scientific studies of these mutation rates, and in fact, a recent uh, paper uh, talking about this uh, in particular, uh, we do not know the probability of uh, the uh, development of these particular mutations. So we really can't put any estimates on uh, that likelihood. We just bring it up as something that, uh, that could uh, occur, uh, an independent evolution of mutations, as Dr. Relman said, in large batch production and other situations uh, where the spores uh, the mutate. To, to your point, though, and, and for clarity, um, amongst the 947 repository samples um, that, were, um, that were suitable for testing, there were a, a number of samples that were positive for one, at least one, of the four mutations. So, for example, um, mutation D, the D type of mutation, showed up in 51 of the repository samples. 51 of the 947 were positive for D. Um, at least D. Um, and we have in our report an enumeration of how many samples were positive for any one, any two, three. Um, and the answer for three is there were two that were positive for three, and then the eight that were positive for four. So they, they do arise. They did, they were found in, in some of these samples. But as to their relationship to 1029, this gets to the provenance and history of the repository samples, um, about which we have partial information, but about which the FBI and the Department of Justice has stated that, um, that many of those samples, even positive for uh, two, linked back to 1029. It's important, I think, for context also to remember that the tests for these mutations were being developed over time. And the first, uh, there's an A, uh, type, morphotype, which had two uh, genetic uh, molecular markers, and those were being done first. And, and in our most recent um, information from the FBI, we were informed that, of course, as the uh, results of just those A1 and A3 uh, mutations were coming in, they were further investigating those that were coming up positive for those two. So. Um, it was a process, again, an interplay between the science and the investigation. Question? If I could just um, press you on the implications of 
this major finding that you cannot definitively link 1029 to the letters. Um, I mean, you, you say that on, on page 119, on page 120, <clears throat> excuse me, you say that the genetic evidence supports the association. <clears throat> Do you think it's more likely that the anthrax in the letters was grown from a sample taken from 29, 1029 than any other possible explanation? In other words, can you give people who are not scientists um, some basis to interpret your report? Are you saying essentially the FBI is wrong and you really need to go back to square one on this investigation? Or are you just making a fairly fine-tuned distinction between what you find to be definitive and what the FBI seems to be overwhelmingly convinced of? It's just, you know, can you give us a practical guide to how to interpret your report? Unfortunately, we can't quantify this uh, for reasons uh, for each of these aspects of the, uh, the potential um, uncertainties in this link. Uh, we do say that uh, the uh, results are consistent with a link between the letter samples and Flask 1029. Uh, but they're not definitive because there are probabilities that other, as other uh, explanations can fill. We can't quantify that uh, for you, unfortunately. To, 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 to state and to repeat what Dr. Gast has, has said, um, today and, and even at that time, one was limited in what was available for testing and may have been limited um, by the ways in which it was collected for testing. And so to look back today on what might be a, a different answer is a very difficult and, and really impossible task given that we can't change the way in which the investigation and the collection of samples, et cetera, unfolded at that time. Sorry, but could you... What would you advise um, a lay person in the public to conclude from what you've just said? Do, do you think that the FBI has done a good job under the circumstances and uh, that that is a, you know, a fairly convincing link between 1029 and letters? Or would you advise the lay person to essentially um, you know, reform the FBI and come up with a new approach to this whole subject? reopen the investigation. It's just very hard to interpret what you're saying in, in a practical sense on what is, after all, of, you know, an investigation of great public interest. What we're saying in a practical sense is that you cannot rely solely on the science and any statements that uh, rely on the science as the, the foundation for a definitive uh, conclusion um, cannot be made because there are um, uh, uncertainties, and particularly in this field of microbial forensics, um, where you have complexities of, of the way uh, the samples uh, evolve and the way they're um, used in the community and the way they've been shared and, and the provenance and all of that. So um, it's really um, just, again, that balance between